My name is Juan Santillan. I'm a paralegal at the Digital Crime Unit. Uh, we're really happy to have you all here. This is actually the third year we've participated, so uh, we're really happy to, to be doing this again. Uh, today, we are uh, we actually did send out a PDF agenda um, last week. If any of you don't have that, we can definitely send that out, and that will show you the rest of the sessions that we have planned this week and next week as well. We have four more after this one. Um, so once again, we're really excited to be participating. Um, if these sessions, like I said, are being recorded, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. And to kick off this series, I'm really uh, excited to introduce our first speaker today, Kojo Mienza. Uh, so Kojo is a cybersecurity and ransomware researcher for the Microsoft Digital Crimes Unit. Uh, he plays many roles. He's an analyst, he's a coder, uh, he's an incident responder, he's a manager, he's a team leader. Uh, he's also the former SOC lead at CFTC, and he's a former cybersecurity analyst at Bond Seckers and Mercy Hospital Systems. Uh, his presentation is about cybersecurity mastery, so without further ado, I'd like to pass this on to you, Kojo. So Kojo, uh, please take it away. All right, good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Awesome, and everyone can see the screen? Yep. All right, great. So um, I wanted to do something a little bit different than you may have you know, commonly heard about getting into this field or um, being successful in this field. Um, so I wanted to uh, focus on the concept of mastery versus uh, just talking about how to get your foot in the door. Uh, we will talk about foot in the door, but I figure, you know, the way I like to think is, you know, with like the old saying, if you aim for the stars, you'll land on the clouds, right? So if we uh, encourage, um, you know, incoming uh, potential security professionals to seek to achieve mastery rather than uh, seeking to achieve uh, just entry level or mediocrity or just enough to keep a job. Um, not only will you guarantee that job security, of course, more greatly, but you'll have a much more fulfilling career. And, um, you know, cybersecurity isn't just about having a job. It's real. It's, these are very real situations. Um, there are, uh, I know you, you guys may have heard in news uh, recently, actually, some of the stuff we're working on. Um, these are very critical situations, right? So you don't want people that just come in for a paycheck. Uh, it's not going to be uh, helpful to anyone. So um, the format of this, I decided to model it after uh, the book by Robert Greene, Mastery. Uh, you guys probably have heard of him. You guys, you know, probably read read a bunch. So you probably read him. Uh, you know, the author of 48 Laws of Power. This book is nothing like that, right? So we're not teaching any dark arts of manipulation or anything like that here. <laughs> But uh, what this book is about is uh, it's a cross comparison of the stories of different masters, right? So from Da Vinci to Coltrane um, to, uh, you know, famous fighter pilots, musicians, painters, what have you, architects. Um, and, you know, talking about the correlations between their journeys. So I'll split this kind of into two parallels, um, what I did versus what I recommend. So. You know, uh, Juan already introduced me, so I won't go through, um, you know, reading all of that verbatim. But um, just to tell you a little bit more about myself, um, I started in tech from the time that I was a kid. So uh, my father had, you know, a theory that if he always kept the most cutting edge technology in our house, his kids would always be on the cutting edge and therefore never getting left behind, right? So he always made sure we had the latest computers, video game systems, TVs, even GPS systems, any new technological device that had just come out. Usually it was like my first house, my house was like the first neighborhood to get it, right? So from a kid, I was a tinkerer. I would play with stuff. I was allowed to break things, take them apart, put them back together again. Um, you know, he just saw it as uh, an investment in the future. Um, I, I like to tell people that my first uh, experience in cybersecurity incident response was uh, as a kid, you know, trying to get games for free uh, that you're supposed to pay for, uh, you know, and doing what we call wares, where it's, you know, cracking software, trying to get past the, you know, the copyright protections and play that game, uh, you know, and you get a bunch of viruses, right? You're, you, you mess around there, you're going to get some viruses. So trying to get viruses off my parents' computers before they came home was my first, uh, you know, experience in cybersecurity incident. That, you know, it was great. You know, you're really under the gun. You're really scared. So that was great training. 
Um, from there, uh, I uh, started coding in high school. I had a great coding teacher. Um, and uh, so I learned Java and C++, took the AP uh, computer science exam for Java. I went to Ohio State as um, a computer science major. I actually didn't like the program. Studied a whole bunch of different things. Uh, I was in college for over four years, but I studied so many different things that I didn't get a bachelor's. I got an associate's. Um, after that, uh, I got IT certifications, went into doing technical support rather than doing coding, um, worked my way up to becoming a domain administrator. Then my first cybersecurity job was at uh, the National Institutes of Health as a cybersecurity incident responder. Uh, incident response uh, slash uh, responder slash analyst. Um, that was a great place to start because of the level of intensity, the high level of scrutiny, and the fact that um, luckily there were some very talented senior people there that I was able to learn from. And I, I'll touch on that a little bit later. So the first stage, uh, and this is before deciding what you're going to do, right? So I have pictures of children for a reason. The key to the first stage is learning like a child, right? Um, that word collage on the right, it's a, you know various uh, terms and fields within technology. Um, just to show you how vast the field is, um, and it's not necessarily for everyone, but it's so vast that many people can find a vertical. So um, oftentimes, you know, you have parents that, you know, they read an article about a shortage of cybersecurity jobs, so they start shoving cybersecurity down their kids' throats. Um, I, I, I don't recommend that approach. I, I recommend that you let your child, or maybe you're not a child, maybe you're already um, in your teenage years or your early adult, or even if you're in your 30s, um, or maybe even older, um, you start learning just by playing with things like a child. Don't be afraid to break things, look into things, be curious and have fun, right? So that's where it all starts. If you take a hold to something, if you really take a liking to something, if you find a calling, then you transition into the next stage where you get a little bit more systematic, right? You're going horizontal then vertical, right? So you find something, let's say it's graphic design, Right. I think graphic design is pretty cool. Let me download Adobe Illustrator. Let me just make a bunch of random stuff. Uh, maybe let me watch a few tutorial videos. OK, uh, maybe I'm bored of graphic design. Let me go horizontal again. Let me go into animation. Uh, OK, animation. Uh, maybe it's not for me. Let me go horizontal again. Let me go to, to web design. But you're going systematic to go vertical. You're going horizontal to go vertical. Uh, the key is to eventually find something that you want to go deep enough into to continue learning something that you're interested enough in something that you, you know you have a calling to for some reason or another that you're willing to go deeper into right um, so horizontal then vertical repeat until you find your calling once you found that calling once you're in that mode uh, where you really you know you think you've really found that thing that you want to master now it's the getting to the hard part of actually studying. I think oftentimes, uh, you know, people start to study before they do the exploration phase. And I think that just makes the studying that much more grueling because you're studying something that you don't really like. So now you know you like that thing, you know you have an interest, now let's go deep. On the bottom left corner is, uh, you know, a nice little home lab. Uh, I used to be a hiring manager at the CFTC, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. And uh, one of the questions we would ask incoming analysts is, do you have a home lab? Um, we would usually ask this to entry level people. And why do we ask this question? We know when we're giving the interview that entry level guys are going to get questions wrong. We're 100 percent. First of all, we want to see if you'll lie to us, <laughs> right? Because, uh, you know, you've got to be pretty honest about your mistakes in this field. Uh, the second part is we want to see outside of work. Do you have enough of interest in this that you would take the time and spend a little bit of money to build a, a home lab, right? It doesn't have to be expensive. You can get a lot of stuff really cheap. You're not trying to build, you know, a, an enterprise system, right? So it's really more about interest. Um, it's not so much about, you know, spending the money. So we want to see if you're going to be willing to do this. So that home lab in the picture exemplifies that. Um, the first bullet, autodidactic learning. 
uh, I can't stress this enough for any tech field. Um, you have to, have to, have to be willing to teach yourself. You cannot always wait and always rely on someone else to teach you. It is extremely important. Uh, I often, <laughs> I used to joke with people back when I did tech support, and they would say, how do you know so much about computers? I was like, well, you, you've got to read. And they, I was like, it's just reading. Like an error code is reading. Um, everything that is that makes up a Microsoft Windows system is literally in manuals written word by word. If you want to learn Windows, you can read to the end of it and you will get a very solid uh, knowledge base. If you want to wait for someone to go through entire textbooks with you, that is expensive. <laughs> and sometimes you may not find that, right? Sometimes you may not have access to that. Um, and you can't do that your whole life. So you have to get into the habit of being that autodidactic um, learner. Um, once you read, practice. So if you read a book like, for example, here on the right, these are this is the trifecta right, of certifications that you need to have to get your foot in the door in cybersecurity. Definitely the third one, Security Plus, is usually a mandatory, but at least one of the first two, ideally all three. So the way you get them, you read the books, practice what the books say, take practice tests, then go take the tests. So read, practice, and keep repeating what you're practicing and get good. Um, some people, I've met people that are extraordinary in the field and don't have degrees or certifications. There's people that are very good with degrees, but no certifications. There's people with certifications, no degrees. All of it is optional. Um, the key is learning. Whatever way you can learn and demonstrate your knowledge and be able to apply it, that's the key. If it, it whichever route fits, I recommend the certification route because it provides some structure and you have, you know, a, a certificate to show to prove that, you know, this particular field. So study, dive deep. And then uh, find a master. Right. So we've got Daniel Sun and Mr. Miyagi. Right. So, you know. I mean, Daniel Sun first shows up, he wants to do tornado kicks and spinning back kicks and, you know, he wants to chop boards and, you know, Mr. Miyagi tells him, no, how about you clean my house first, right? Build up some wrist strength, you know, wax on, wax off. Um, seeking your first job, not for uh, compensation, but not because it's your dream job, not because, you know, you know, you think that this is going to be the be all end all. Seek your first job for education. So get in somewhere and where you get in, try to find a master. Try to find someone who's senior to you that really knows the ropes because a lot of this, especially in, my, in this field, cybersecurity, you can't put it all in a book. Um, a lot of times you need to learn from someone and then you need to get hands on experience to really experience those situations. I mean, you can read about a cyber attack for a while and you should read about it and you should study that before you get to this stage. But eventually you need to get in somewhere and you need to go and work on the front lines. So my, my, uh, my apprenticeship stage was largely at NIH. So I had um, a couple of guys there who were senior and who were just absolutely amazing. Uh, one of the guys works at the NSA now the other guy works at the Department of Energy, of even the nuclear department. So uh, I had like a really exemplary master's. One of the guys, the guy that works at Department of Energy, he actually created a book club because he, you know, it really embodied this concept. Um, uh, and so all the tier one analysts, which I was a tier one analyst at the time, we would go to the book club every week. The book club would meet. We'd have to read the book. We'd have to, he, you know, he'd pepper us with questions. Um, so. Uh, that was uh, my kind of apprenticeship phase and my absorbing that master. And even he helped me a lot with understanding how I could cross section these different fields that I had studied before and apply them to cybersecurity. So how could I leverage more of my coding skills as a cybersecurity analyst? And, you know, really, how could I mesh that? So um, this stage is extremely important, um, in my opinion. Um, being able to absorb and the the other thing about finding a master is you must be a student first, right? I don't know if you've heard that old um, adage. I believe it's an old Chinese story about the student who's seeking a master. He goes to the master's house 
Uh, he tells him that he wants to be his student. He tells him about all these things he knows and all these different people he studied under. The master then goes and says, I'll, I'll pour you a cup of tea. Uh, the master sits down, he begins pouring the tea, and he keeps pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring. The student is imploring the master to stop pouring the tea. The master doesn't stop pouring the tea. He just keeps pouring and asks the student what's wrong. He says, master, stop pouring the tea. And he says, why should I stop pouring? The student says, it's already full, why are you still pouring? And he stops and says, it's full like you. You can't learn if you're already full of yourself, right? If you or if you already think you know, and that's one of the things that we we come across uh, a lot is like, you know, you we come across candidates that, um, you know, maybe, maybe you have a degree and maybe, you know, you, you're very high up on that achievement. Sometimes people have master's degrees uh, and are very high up on that achievement, but we know that, for some reason you're still entry level or you're still mid tier if you're not willing to learn there's nothing we're going to be able to do with you we we have to pick another candidate so you must be a student first before you can absorb a master and of course you guys you guys know that as teachers so um let me go back second phase of apprenticeship um is you've already absorbed the master you've already learned a good amount Right, you've already studied, you've already got in, you've already started absorbing, you've already started learning. Now it's time to train. It's time to repeat, 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 and and really build yourself with the information that you've gathered uh, to becoming more of a master. So um, oftentimes a lot of like entry level guys, they hate doing the grunt work, right? So there's grunt work in cybersecurity. There's uh, you know, phishing emails. All these emails come in. You've got to check them one by one. You got to check the attachments. You got to check the links in there. You've got to vet it against sources. Sometimes you might have to do 20, 25 of those in a day. Then we've got, you know, there's uh, there's boatloads of, you know, known bad websites. We need you to check this whole list. We need you to go through it. We need you to tell us why it's bad in a in a spreadsheet. We need you to load it into the tool. A lot of guys hate hate that, but they, uh, you know, it's a lack of understanding that that is the core strength, the fundamental strength that you build to get to the next level. Um, so, you know, telling, you know, you know, telling students and, you know, potential entrants into the field that uh, they need to be willing to do that level of training after they may already have a degree, after they may already have the certification is extremely, extremely important because the people I know that didn't build that, they're, they're always missing something. And you don't want to get to the point where you're a mid-tier analyst and there's a entry-level analyst who comes to you and says, hey, what's this? <laughs> and, you know, your skills show that you're lacking and, hey, maybe the maybe it's a certain time where you're the only person in the security operations center and the buck stops with you right so you want to have that base knowledge um and and skill um so after you feel as if you're no longer apprentice it's time to graduate right um at this point you should seek employment for compensation now you're actually good right at this point, you are actually good. You're actually better than the vast majority of people if you followed the process. And you should go get paid and you should enjoy the money. <laughs> and um, you should now go into an environment where you're not seen as the apprentice anymore. Um, I'll go on to the next slide. Um, and in the middle there, that's a picture of John Coltrane. So uh, Ro uh, Robert Green talks about Coltrane in his book. And uh, Coltrane's a very interesting character. He purposefully went into as many bands as he possibly could to learn all the different styles and rhythms and all the different instruments and the way people mixed and the way people composed. He finally got into the, uh, the band of Miles Davis, the, the jazz great, uh, and eventually he got to the point where Coltrane could no longer mesh in uh, Miles Davis's band. Um, he was doing these elaborate solos, like if you've ever heard of Love Supreme, you know, and people hadn't even heard of heard stuff like that before. And Miles Davis is like you're clashing. And of course, he had already learned for a lot from Miles Davis. He'd learned a ton from him. Um, but at a certain point, you will you'll still sometimes you're still seen as the apprentice, so it's time to leave. And then if Coltrane went and started his own band, and of course the rest the rest is history. Um, so this is the post apprenticeship. 
uh, it's the time of getting creative. Like Coltrane started getting creative with his solos. And uh, Robert Greene talks about this in his book. And um, in, my, in my life, what, what a lot of this was, was you know, coding applications, creating new pieces of software that could expedite certain common cybersecurity tasks, right? So some of this grunt work, turn it into automation, right? Instead of checking these websites one by one, create a program that checks with outside sources and does the checking for you and puts it in a list for you and even sends it to the tools for you, right? But it's that getting creative um, that of course you need the fundamentals to do, right? You can't create software that automatically does something that you don't know how to do manually, right? So you're building on top of that foundation that you already have. But what it does is it helps you even fill in the pieces. It helps you expand and it puts you on that road to mastery. And so, of course, the final stage, um, hopefully if you get this far, is mastery, right? The fusion of the innovative and the rational, right? The foundational knowledge on, uh, on the bottom, on top of the creative aspect, helps you get to the point of truly, truly encompassing the field, uh, really being a master, um, really being someone that can understand, that can expand, and that can be a teacher. Um, widen your vision. Um, try not to get myopic. Oftentimes, sometimes we all know the old master that refuses to learn in any new kicks, right? You know, it, it, there's this new, there's this new technique. Like I, 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 I study at a martial arts dojo, and uh, my my master told me about how long it took him from uh, to accept a 180 degree stance <laughs> versus kind of standing at a 45 degree angle, right? But being willing to do that, he realized many, many other disciplines and why the, with the value of standing 180 degrees, right? So widen your vision. And of course, no one ever gets good enough to stop practicing. The best at everything still practiced oftentimes more than people that are even starting out. So you never, never get away from the practice element. Oh, let's go back. So why um, is this system, the apprenticeship system, I see as ideal for cybersecurity? So number one, uh, this whole field was created by people who are self-taught. This whole field was created by tinkerers. Um, it wasn't created by, uh, you know, the classical means of many other fields, you know, via academia. Most of the top hackers have never gone to college. Um, some of them are high school dropouts. Uh, uh, they're very counterculture, right? For, you know, as we all know, um, you're dealing with people who are so embedded in what they do, uh, who are so in love with, with what they do. They're do totally off the beaten track. You have to, in some way, find a way to mirror your your opponent, right? Uh, if your opponent is that hands-on, if he's that self-taught. You can't necessarily just have the classical, you know, go get a four-year degree, come out, and then think you're going to deal with these guys. You're, you're going to have a lot of trouble. Uh, you're really going to have a lot of trouble. Um, the hands-on experience, right? Uh, why the apprenticeship system? So being willing to start at the bottom. Corporate computing is totally different than computing at home, right? That was the first thing that hit me when I got into technical support. Like, this is not... This is not the Windows I know, <laughs> um, right? Um, knowing the very basics and knowing the core of how enterprise systems work is fundamental to being able to understand when something isn't working right, understand how to navigate within a corporate environment, understand what's safe and what's not, what should be somewhere what isn't but should should be and and so forth right um so that's extremely important cost effectiveness right uh i think you know there's a lot of talk about the price of college education and you know even oftentimes the average middle class kid can't even afford a college education without going into debt you can get into cybersecurity without getting into any debt you 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 either go the certification route those certifications i cost you will cost you no more than a thousand dollars maybe a couple hundred over if you want to buy some extra books and extra materials thousand dollars and then you're coming in with a starting salary 
worst case scenario, worst case scenario, 45,000. But on average, you'll come in making 70, 75,000 on a $1,000 investment. Very cost effective, very efficient societally, right? So instead of everyone spending tons and tons of money and using tons and tons of resources, you can get a lot more people actually doing it in a cost effective method. The speed, right? You can get into the field faster through the apprenticeship route versus the college route. And then finally, um, cybersecurity is multidisciplinary by nature. Um, we've heard of all the different attacks that happen on all different pieces of software, all different, all different places. Um, knowing a bunch of different things, right? Knowing what's normal uh, with various systems, right? Knowing what's normal on Apple, on, uh, on, a, on a Windows system, on a Linux system, knowing various pieces of software, really getting into the systems, right? Even so, I mean, like you'd be surprised, like even knowing things about certain games has come into play in my cybersecurity career. You never know what's going to pop up. That's part of the nature of the field. So the more wide you, you know, your knowledge is, right? The more likely that when something's wrong or when something pops up, you're going to be the person that uh, has just a little bit of you know background knowledge on it, and you know maybe that is the difference between you know stopping uh, an attack early or letting it spread while everyone tries to figure it out, right? Um, so you know um, there was one more bullet I didn't add, um, and talking about college, it's it's optional. Um, I, I think I think that the universities have a role to play. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say to neglect them, uh, but I, I, I would say that maybe the system sh can be slightly more adapted. And why why do I say that? A lot of um, my experience as a hiring manager, um, unfortunately, a lot of the kids coming out of good schools uh, can't answer entry level questions, easy entry entry level questions in cybersecurity interviews. Um, person after person, even people that have a degree work somewhere but kind of pigeonholed themselves and never kind of expanded as soon as you start asking them questions just a little bit outside of their comfort zone where you know maybe they were doing the same thing and never expanding they can't answer those questions so that is why i advocate this system of starting at the you know starting from exploration no like really getting interested in something before you dive in then diving in, then becoming an apprentice, and then trying to do something creative, and then finally getting to that point where you can bring other people up, right? Um, I believe it's in Switzerland that the apprenticeship system is still uh, used quite often for a great number of um, uh, of uh, professions there, and you know they've they've got great um, professionals, of course, in in finance and even in tech. Um, and even in the United States, the apprenticeship system used to be used a lot more. So it's nothing new. It's it's, it's old. Um, it's just different. And I think that for this field, because of the qualities of this field, uh, because of who you're dealing with in this field, um, it, it, it it is an ideal system for cybersecurity. So thanks for listening. Um, any questions? So there is one in the chat. Let me read it real quick. I saw that one. So uh, entry level questions. Um, so yeah, you can you can jot these down. So knowing just the core basics, right? Like if, if, if you can't answer the question, what is an IP address? You're probably not going to get the job, right? How does DNS, the domain name system work, right? Um, the, there is a Windows, one of the things that a lot of people don't know, and this is goes back to my point about getting, you know, starting in tech support. I really advocate starting in tech support help desk, right? Dealing with all those problems, getting your hands on into corporate computing before things get critical. I mean, because the le level of um, importance of a cybersecurity person's decision making versus a tech support person's decision making is massive. So getting, but it's still some pressure, right? You've got angry customers they want to get back online. so learning how to fix Microsoft Word or learning how to uninstall a program properly or even dealing with um, 
you know, baby malware, I'll call it, right? They call it adware, just a little annoying stuff that'll just, you know, reroute your browser or something, right? Learning how to deal with that in the tech support role is really important. So like a lot of people come in and I'm like, hey, how do you reset a password? They've never reset a password before, <laughs> right? Because, you know, you may not necessarily get that experience um, in a degree program, and then you're trying to step right into directly into cybersecurity before going and doing those things like resetting passwords and adding new users. And I think there was a second question one. Uh, actually, let me let me give you a couple more uh, entry level questions. Um, what do you do? So you know, a user says, "Hey, I've got this funny looking email. They report it to the cybersecurity operations center. What do you do from step one to to finish? Right, the incident response lifecycle." Um, how do you find threats on the network? Um, Active Directory, they'll ask you, how do you reset a password? Um, uh, what are, how, how would you change someone's password complexity? Um, how do you know uh, a piece of software is malicious? What do you do? How do you know that's not a legitimate program, right? Have, you know, a lot of it is analysis and assessment. Um, there's a ton of, there's a great book if you really want called IT Security Interviews Exposed. So if you have any kids that are really interested in knowing those entry level questions, that's a great reference book. They'll give you a, a bunch of uh, uh, you know commonly asked questions in that. And the other question was, uh, when you talk about not being able to answer the questions, are you referring to an algorithm they need to solve or the way they're answering the question? So like soft skills, they're not they're not willing to learn. Um, no, I wouldn't say soft skills. They're, they're <laughs> I, I, soft skills are important. They are a deficit in most tech, tech fields. A lot of tech people <laughs> sometimes don't have soft skills. Um, but when I say not being able to answer your question, I mean not having the knowledge or the experience, right? Um, it's, it's either one of those or a combination of both. So just not being able to answer that tech. If I say what's the domain name system and you can't, like if you can't explain to me, if I will ask a question like, hey, what is what happens on your network? What happens on your computer when you type Google.com? You need to understand how you get to Google.com, right? You can't have a layman's answer. You need to understand what happens from point A to point B as much as possible. There's a lot of intricacies, but we look to see how many details do you know? And why is that important, right? Um, the basics of networking are extremely important um, because uh, everything works on trust relationships, right? So for some reason, your computer trusted Google.com. What made your computer trust Google.com, right? What made your computer know that Google.com resided at this address, at this IP address, right? Um, understanding that is because, right, malware also uses websites, right? The bad guys also use websites. So understand, like, say you have a, an attack and someone clicked on a link how do you know they actually went there versus they just clicked on a link, right? If you don't understand how you get to google.com, <laughs> trust me, that situation with the hacker is going to be way too difficult for you to solve, right? And I think this question is just in general, and I don't know if you know this, Kojo, but um, I don't know if they, they offer any job shadows for a day or guest speaking for students on cybersecurity. I'm sure some people on Microsoft must do something like that, but. Uh, I'm not sure yeah. if any of you know that. I would just, uh, this is Zoe, and, you know, I would leverage uh, Juan and my email addresses. I think Richard will provide those. And um, there are, I mean, there are opportunities, I think, to do these sorts of things, um, but we would take them on a kind of ad hoc request. So feel free to reach out to us and we'll see what what we can do. There are programs, but they're pretty formal. I think I did. I, I might have. There is a high school internship program. I think I put a link on the resources there. Uh, but this question is more less about um, uh, internships and more about it, just a job shadow. And I could imagine us. I could. I could see us doing something like that. So just reach out to myself and Juan, and we can see what we can uh, take a look at it. There's some other good questions here, Juan. You wanna? Yeah, so this question is just general. So ransomware, is this a different type of problem in cybersecurity? Um, so ransomware is a certain type of cyber attack, right? So ransomware is essentially where attackers, they get on your network and they encrypt all your files, 
Uh, they, they try to encrypt as many important files as they can. Sometimes they'll encrypt your entire databases. Um, since it's encrypted, you won't be able to access it. So it locks it up. So you lock up all their files, you lock up the systems. Um, and basically, they're holding it hostage and saying, you need to pay this certain amount of money before I'll either give you the decryption software or the key that'll unlock these files for you. Right. So it's essentially a hostage situation. Um, there's uh, many stages of how it works. Um, it gets it, it varies for the different attacker. But one of the things is, um, uh, you know, having good cybersecurity people, right, to kind of stick to the theme, right? Uh, they can, if you have people that are vi vigilant, these attacks can be stopped before they get to that stage. Because often the attackers will already be on your network. They'll already be probing around. They'll already be doing certain things that will give them away before the ransomware. So having people that know how to do what's called threat hunting, where you, you're, you know, there, there might not be. So there's, you know, in, in your typical, typical operation center, you've got tons of tools and the tools have rules that look for certain things going on. They'll give you alerts. Um, one of the things is some people only look at the alerts <laughs> and the tools are imperfect. They're going to miss things. That's why you need good professionals who know how to sift through the data, right? Who know how to, you know, apply a hypothesis to the data and say, if this thing is happening, maybe then this, it might mean this. If I see any of this, then I should look at this and sift through the data, uh, you know, in a somewhat scientific method and a rigorous method uh, and look for those those early warning signs for things like ransomware. Yeah. There was another question. You touched on this a little bit, but it's would you say computer tech is more self-directed or collaborative in learning? Um, I would say it's more self-directed, but there's no reason that you can't make it collaborative. So um, interesting story. I actually have a huge group of friends out here um, where we actually kind of help each other um get get help people get into the tech support field get into cybersecurity. um we help each other with resumes we give each other mock interviews um you know I, some people work together on government contracts and you know bring other people on um i've brought in, brought some of my friends on to other contracts so um community is always helpful usually for for humans you know it's 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 good to have someone to you know to sometimes study with or ask questions with, you know, definitely. Um, but never rely on that totally. The people in that group, some people in that group that totally rely on that, they haven't gotten very far, right? So oh, it's more self-directive, but no reason it can't be collaborative. You're welcome. All right, so there's another question. It says, you mentioned the eagerness for tinkering and to not follow the money. Kids are always excited to play video games, but they are hungry to, to, to earn money. And we teachers try to encourage their talents, hobbies for job, job hunting. What is the salary range for starting out in your division and how high can it go? Um, so my starting sal salary in cybersecurity was $72,000. Um, that's still pretty much the average. I know some people that started off at 45,000. I know some people that started off at 90,000. So, um, you know, it's you, you're definitely not going to be making less than an average American citizen. You're going to be it, it, you're going to, you know, especially if you're good, you're, you're going to make above average money. But the problem is some people that I know that focus on the money first. Um, it people people will spot you out, right? Like uh, you're working with very smart people. You're not going to trick everyone. You might trick some people, but eventually someone's going to know, hey, this guy either cheated on his certs, cheated in college or something. I don't know how he got in the door, but he's not really good. And, um, you know, when your resume starts to reflect that and your references start to reflect that and your experiences start to reflect that, um, it's not it's not good for longevity, let's say. Any other questions from anyone else? I see, I do see a question up here that talks about, asks about um, any particular website that would be useful to students who want to start the exploration stage. Yeah, I wouldn't. Um, 
I wouldn't try to even confine it uh, in the exploration stage uh, to any specific site. Um, I would literally say give the kid a computer that you do not care about. And if uh, uh, you can segment it, you know, get it on a different network than the rest of the family network, because kids get a lot of viruses, especially if you're encouraging them to tinker. Get them a computer. Um, get them if you can get them a laptop and a desktop. Get them both. Um, if not, get a desktop. They often are cheaper, and they're great. Desktops are great for opening up and learning about the parts and things like that, and adding in different parts. And um, so, yeah, they're they're cheaper. They they look like a kind of a play box. <laughs> um, so I would say, not a website, but get them a computer. Um, get them if they're if they show an interest in switches get them or uh, switches and routers get them as get them some switches and routers uh whatever they show interest in just get a cheap um version of that uh and um you know let them let them play around um uh youtube is great you know so that that's also another place they can explore pretty far in and um i wouldn't say any specific website i would just say start googling stuff you know, just start Googling. Or binging. Sorry, this is Microsoft. And there was a question about um, if Microsoft pays for, uh, and, and they do pay us a, a certain amount for educational purposes every year. So that was already answered on there. Um, I'm not yes, and I, and I took advantage of that program. And um, it was awesome. It took me a while because I, um, uh, you know, just to balance work and school. And also, um, you know, to take it full advantage and have it all be paid for, you kind of stagger it out. So I got my MBA. It took me about four four years to do, but it was awesome. I went to Seattle University. It was a massive benefit. Loved it. Um, um, Kojo, the, going back, you had talked about, hey, just get a computer. There was a question up here I saw, and it actually said about building, where did it go? Oh, okay. Yeah, it says yeah, it says, uh, about elementary age students. If we as teachers were to provide students with a lab space in the classroom, what particular things do you think would be important to include? Um, same as if you were going to do it with a kid. So I mean, I, I'll 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 say the way um, my dad did it was he just bought a computer. Uh, he said, okay, this is the kid's computer. The adults the adult, adults don't use this computer. Um, then he just started teaching us really basic things. Teach them, you know, how to plug in a mouse, how to plug in a keyboard, how to install some software, right? How to install a web browser. Um, start teaching them just the real basics, like like even teach them a little bit of Excel, right? Not like deep formulas, right? But just show them what you use it for. The, the I think when it comes to kids. Um, um the wider you kind of let their minds roam and i'm sure you guys know more than me but the more likely it is that they'll find interest versus if you bring in discipline and strictness too early you may turn them off to it so you know have lessons where you teach very simple things but then have a lot of playtime right where you know, you just, hey, you just do whatever you want, right? I, I When I was a kid, I just used to like to click click everything. I would open mm -hmm. programs I had no idea about, and I would just like to click on as many things as I could. And since it didn't matter what happened, I wasn't scared to click, right? So don't be, you know, you have to remove that fear. A lot of times people, um, you know, a lot of older people that struggle with computers, they're so fearful, right? Like they're like, oh, if I touch this, uh, what's going what's gonna to happen? Oh, wait, wait, can I, can I close this window? <laughs> It's like if you close the window, you know, you can open it again. You know, you just have to say say first. Right. So removing that fear and kind of unlocking that is really important. So teach very, very basics, very, very basic con computing concepts and, um, you know, allow for a lot of playtime. Any other questions for Kojo? These have been great questions. Thank you, everyone. I, I do, Kojo, I, you have been doing some really 
cool work and really impactful work on as part of the Digital Crimes Unit ransomware team. And I know you can't talk about the specific investigations, but I was wondering, if, I mean, I just am fascinated. I love listening to you uh, talk about some of the, um, you know, you're trying to track and do some attribution on some of these um, criminal groups. I'd love, could you just talk for like a minute or two about what kind of what, um, what your day is like around uh, kind of what you're hunting, what you're hunting for, what you're looking for? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it really depends on the day. So, um, you know, what we do is we're trying to uh, disrupt the infrastructure of uh, criminal actors and maybe even figure out who they are. Um, so in doing that, you have to get pretty creative because, of course, they don't want to be found. Um, so, you know, some of what we do is we we actually start with um, whatever I call it pulling on threads. So like even even on the analysis side, it's I, I try to teach new analysts like find once you find a thread, find whatever thread you can and pull on it and see what's behind it. So like uh, we'll, we we do a lot of like um, analysis of the malware itself. Um, so with ransomware, we look a lot at, uh, at the ransom notes that get dropped. Uh, we check out the websites. Um, I try to track the flows of the cryptocurrency because uh, oftentimes the ransom note may have a wallet address in it. So you go on the blockchain, you track that. Um, sometimes they have a website where you know, they'll say, hey, you know, you add in the note, they'll basically say, hey, if you're a victim of this, blah, 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 you know, you need to go to this website to talk to us. So we check out those websites. Sometimes I, I uh, check the code of the website. So I'll I'll take the code of the website down and try to understand how the website works. Sometimes we trick the threat actors to divulging information or um, making some other mistake. So we try to find we try to find chinks in their armor. Um, and uh, eventually, you know, we try to build a try to prove a case that they that this person or persons are in fact malicious actors. So you have to prove that the malware is malicious, right? That it does do some type of harm to a computer system. Then you've got to um, understand the threat actor. So we do a lot of intelligence gathering um, on um, the like what is out there or what uh, whatever we can find to gauge the risk of uh, maybe disrupting one of their servers. Hey, if we disrupt the server, what could they do with this victim's information and so forth? So it's very interesting, um, really interesting work. Um, and yeah, it, um, so a lot, another like, so, um, thinking of Zoe, um, some some of the things we do are massive data projects, right? So we have one big data project where we're we're gathering um, from about six, seven different families of ransomware, and we do what's called sandboxing, where you you get the malware into this environment, it explodes basically. Just think of it exploding, letting all of the data out, and then we're just grabbing the pieces that we want and putting it in a database and putting it on a dashboard so everyone can see. So, um, so, so many different things. And it, I, I'm sure we're always coming up with new methods because it's very uncharted territory. Yeah. Thanks, Kojo. We did have some questions come in. So one says, uh, I'm a forensics teacher. I was wondering about the intersection between cybersecurity and CSI. Oh, yeah. Um, so forensics is a field within cybersecurity. It's a, uh, it's, def it's a discipline within it. Um, I used to work uh, at CFTC. Actually, the forensics lab was adjacent with us. So sometimes we would ask for the forensics team. So say a cyber attack occurs and you, um, let's say, for example, the organization doesn't have the proper tools uh, to have gathered all the information, uh, you will call in a forensics guy um, to kind of do what's called digital forensics um, on the system. Uh, what you know, every basically think of it as 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 a, a physical forensics person goes to the crime scene and snaps photos. A digital forensics person does the same thing on a computer. So snapping a, a photo of the state of the computer of the state of the memory, everything that was on there, then you've got there's um specific software that you'll use and you basically take those photos and go down, down deep into sometimes even like the bit level um, to assess it. So actually some of our, our work, um, you know, touches on touches on forensics. Um, so like, for example, 
we might um, like malware analysis sandboxing is is kind of is is basically forensics because you're taking the malware that the threat actor would have used. You're in fact, you're purposefully infecting some um, dummy environment, and then you're collecting forensic data to better understand the malware. So yeah, there's a, there's a huge cross section, and it's, it's an entire discipline in and of itself. Um, and there's there's so many reasons it can be used. I, I've 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 seen it used to uh, find like um, like I guess like employees that um, you know may are doing things that they shouldn't be doing at work. Let's say, right? Sometimes they call in digital forensics guys for that um in, in in the government not in most companies <laughs> so i i really like this question it says i work with students who are english as a second language students and they think that their home language is a hindrance not an asset to companies uh, tell me how cultural diversity and spoken written language can be an asset to your teams at microsoft oh it's a huge asset um we hacking is happening all around the world. There are hackers from every country, um, and a lot of cybersecurity is actually um, centered around intelligence. the The more you know about the world around you, it is actually an asset to you uh, as a cybersecurity analyst or or a threat intelligence expert. Um, I I. Uh, I, I like to read a lot about like world politics and history and stuff like that. And it's interesting how often that actually um, helps you understand who might be doing this cyber attack. What may their motivations be, right? Being up on um, affairs like that can be helpful. Sometimes you see, sometimes I've had to translate from other languages um, certain things that I found on a website or in a piece of malware and I actually have to translate their, that, that language to English to understand it. So um, I guess I haven't seen too much in uh, the Spanish language. I haven't, I haven't seen too much if that's their second language. I'm not sure what their second language is, but um, certainly we've had to translate from Chinese, Russian, um, sometimes Arabic, um, German. Uh, so um, yeah, understanding the world around you is a huge asset, a huge asset. Yeah. Yeah, I was just commenting that our presenter tomorrow, Kristen, has recently hired um, uh, analysts, Intel analysts, covering a variety of countries and, and languages um, to address nation state. And so I couldn't agree more with what with what Kojo said. I mean, I I think that um, that that. Um, it's not just a specific language, but I think that skill set. So yeah, it's not a hindrance. I think that would be an, an asset. I think that's a really good question. Thank you. And 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 just to add to that, you know, Microsoft's always looking for diverse candidates. You know, we bring different perspectives. I myself was one of those second language kids, so I can see how sometimes your experience is just different and very helpful, right? Um, in in different ways that you may not even really think about in the moment. Uh, Another question is, what do you see as the biggest shift within your field in the next decade? Is it AI state-sponsored attacks, new encryption technology? Um, I think AI is already happening. Uh, so I think that'll be the next big shift. Um, you already have tools that are utilizing AI. Um, it's not perfect yet to the point where you can fire all your analysts <laughs> and just have the machines doing it. It's nowhere near that, to be honest with you. Um, so that'll be next, but I think the next like, quantum leap will be quantum computing. I think um, if quantum computing starts to be utilized more greatly, it's going to change everything um, just because of the sheer amount of computing power that can be leveraged. Um, one of the key concepts in uh, cybersecurity is encryption, right? And why does encryption work? Encryption works because uh, in order for you to figure out the Basically, in order for you to decrypt the computer, to, to crack the code of what the encryption uh, has done, you would need tons of supercomputers to do it, right? Some encryptions will take you a trillion years with regular computing power to decrypt it. That's why it works, right? It's not that the data has actually gone anywhere or anything. It's just figuring it out takes too much computing power, but quantum can change all of that, right? Um, imagine hackers or state-sponsored uh, uh, threat actors using quantum computers to break encryptions. Uh, it changes everything. Yeah. 
so that that's that's a new that's a new challenge and I, and uh, I haven't worked with a quantum computer yet. There, there, are very, there are not many, very many in the world yet. But that, that'll be something on the horizon for sure. Yeah, all right. Let's see if any new ones came in. Oh, have you had any involvement with electronic medical records, EMR, EHR? Yeah. Um. <clears throat> I. Uh, not overly closely to the point of actually getting on the databases, but um, yeah, um, at Bon Secours Mercy, um, you know, of course, we're using electronic medical records. They were also at uh, National Institutes of Health, sometimes being used, especially at the clinical center. Um, it's a huge deal. Uh, hospitals are heavily attacked because of the type of information that they have, and also because of the, the fact that sometimes they're soft targets. So you've got tons of personal information because you have to give all your personal information, right? So hackers know that and therefore they attack hospitals. Um, uh, unfortunately, hospitals are of course life critical. And so we've seen a lot of ransomware attacks hitting hospitals. Um, so they may take those medical records hostage. Um, the security of the medical records, it is it's actually, it's, it's pretty complex to an extent just because of um, um, the different companies involved and kind of um, the different laws uh, and regulations uh, in terms of how to move them, how to store them, trying to get certain companies uh, like Epic <laughs> uh, to follow standards uh, is a challenge. So um, it's a huge deal within cybersecurity. It's so much a niche within itself. Yeah. Well, I think we're almost out of time. Any last questions before we wrap this up? Uh, Kojo, this has been a great presentation. Let's see if anything else comes in. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Zoe, anything else before we close it up? No, no, this was really interesting. And uh, Kojo, I loved it. I loved your perspective and um, I really enjoyed this. So, and thank you to everyone. And your questions are great. And uh, this is really fun. Thanks. Thanks, Juan. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Letting if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to myself, Zoe, or, or uh, Richard, and we can follow up with uh, those answers. And thank you all for being here. Uh, we'll see you here tomorrow at the same time for our next session. All right. Thanks, you're everyone. welcome, everyone. And thanks bye -bye. for listening. Uh, I really enjoyed it as well. Um, anytime. Anytime. Thank you, Kojo. Take, take care. Thank have you. Bye-bye.